Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to our second afternoon of Amplifier 2017. I hope everyone's excited. I'm certainly excited uh, to introduce this next session. So first of all, a welcome to all of our guests, both AMP staff. I know we've got members of the board and our group executive here today, and obviously our, our guests from beyond AMP as well. My name's Scott Barnett. I'm the head of technology for Bank, uh, previously the head of technology for data and analytics. And we're talking this afternoon about data and analytics, and I'm in incredibly excited to have Richard Socher join us this afternoon. He's the chief data scientist from Salesforce, but uh, we'll introduce more about Richard in a minute. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, anyone that was at the early sessions yesterday morning, uh, if you saw the Tesla insane mode, I'd strongly encourage you, there's a Tesla down in, the, uh, down in the ground floor just outside the building. You might want to go and have a look. I'm not sure they'll put it into insane mode for you, but uh, certainly worth a look. Don't forget we've got Wi-Fi. As part of the Wi-Fi access for the event, you do have full access to AFR.com uh, as part of that. So please jump onto the Amplify Wi-Fi. And also don't forget to get involved uh, in the social media as well with the hashtags that are available on the screen. Uh, I won't take any more time at the moment. Obviously, please do have your questions ready. We will have a Q&A session uh, at the end of Richard's presentation. But first of all, let me introduce Rob Wickham. Rob is the Vice President of Innovation for Asia Pacific at Salesforce. And as the sponsor of this session, Rob is going to introduce Richard. Thank you, Scott, and hello, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today. At Salesforce, we've been on a journey to make enterprise software as easy to use as buying a book on Amazon. And more recently, in the last couple of years, we've brought that same approach to artificial intelligence, to bring that same experience that everyone is having in their personal lives when you're using Apple, Facebook, or Amazon, to your enterprise experience. And as part of that strategy, we have acquired over 10 companies that are pioneers in their respective artificial intelligence fields. One of the most exciting is MetaMind. So we are certainly delighted to have with us today Richard Socher, the former founder and CEO of MetaMinds. And this is his first visit to Australia. So Richard, welcome. Just a little bit about Richard. Richard did his PhD at Stanford in computer science, focusing on artificial intelligence, working alongside Anju Ning, who is a pioneer in natural language processing, as well as Chris Heinemann, who is a um, well-cited individual in computer vision. Um, Richard now leads Salesforce Research Group, where he has a team of researchers that are pushing the envelope on the state of artificial intelligence and bringing breakthroughs to everyone. He was, in 2017, he was inducted into the World Economic Forum class of 100 young global leaders. And as part of that process, and I quote, they recognize Richard as one of the prodigies of artificial intelligence and deep learning whose breakthrough technologies are transforming natural language processing and computer vision. So we're an esteemed company. So please join me in welcoming Richard Socha. Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to be here and uh, on this beautiful continent for the first time. So I want to talk to you today about the edge of artificial intelligence and what's going on in the future of AI. When we think about the future of AI, it kind of helps to actually take a step back and look at the definition of artificial intelligence. And when we do that, we actually notice that it's constantly moving. It's always changing what we actually consider as artificial intelligence. And it started with some simple things like playing chess. And people thought, wow, once we can play chess, we're going to be really, really good in artificial intelligence, because all our smartest people are so good at playing chess. And nowadays, uh, recently, uh, people got very excited about the game of Go. It's much more complex than chess from a computational perspective. There are an insane number of potential possible games. Uh, yet, all of these games are very discrete. The action space is discrete, uh, and you can sample. You have a, can have a simulation and play the game over and over and over again. And sadly, that's not true for real life. We cannot try 
and have a conversation over and over again until we finally say something that works uh, with some customer. Uh, so that's actually a good way to think about uh, artificial intelligence and to really do some retrospective. Uh, a lot of times AI researchers are very smart people and they think about, well, you know, what got me here? I'm really smart, I can do math well, I can play chess well, I can memorize lots of things. But of course, computers can already do all those things. What actually gets hard is the stuff that we all take for granted, like speech recognition. Uh, that was a really hard problem for AI. Now, we kind of solved it, uh, largely thanks to deep learning and large neural network architectures, bigger data sets, more computational power. And now that we've solved it, we don't really consider AI anymore. Nobody's that amazed anymore and they just ask for the weather on their phone. Uh, and that was one of those shifts where we've solved something in AI and then we don't call it AI anymore. Now it's just speech recognition. Another area that is very solved now is computer vision. Uh, not in its entirety, but in a large variety of ways, we can now actually very accurately classify whole images and identify you know, whether we see a dog in that image or a cooler or any other kind of specific object. In fact, we make it so easy now, you can literally drag and drop images into a browser or use some very simple code and integrate uh, that into your CRM. Uh, inside Salesforce, there are a lot of other options. There's open source, uh, all, there are open source alternatives for this and so on. So image classification is a largely solved problem as long as you can have a representative set of at least a thousand examples per class that you're trying to identify. Where it gets even more interesting is that we now can also identify and count objects and images. So here's an example of InBev, uh, that beverage company that basically sells a lot of different types of beer. Uh, and they can now go and in stores, take pictures and then count how many bottles do you actually see in the shelf? Something that's very important for consumer packaged goods companies that kind of lose track of that last mile where they, they can do the, all the logistics, can really accurately identify what every, where everything goes, but once it's actually in the store, it's, it's a very fuzzy, unstructured data problem. Uh, with the help of object detection and uh, things that we can also do in the Einstein Vision program, they can actually, they don't have to have people go take pictures and then manually painstakingly say, all right, I see three bottles of this kind and two bottles of that kind and so on, they can automate that process. And the same technology can be used, um, is used by Metro to identify the quality of decor in restaurants and help people uh, in the restaurant industry and several others to identify uh, potential improvements uh, and qualify leads, help uh, with catering decisions and so on. Now, computer vision has gone so far, we are actually also able to ask questions about images that I don't think would have been possible even five years ago. So you can, and these are all screenshots uh, here of a system that is trained, uh, it's actually one of our uh, academic papers that we published last year, uh, where at training time you get an image and a question, and then you're supposed to predict an answer. And here are test examples that the algorithm had never seen and on the right side here we see where the algorithm pays attention to in order to answer that question and so we can ask what color are the bananas pays attention to these bananas in the middle and realizes they're green or what is the pattern on the cat's fur on its tail and it finds uh, that the answer here is stripes so really incredible understanding of the visual world that we now observe in AI algorithms and really once you train an algorithm really well in a specific domain, there are a lot of applications uh, that you can see. And it really gets a very fine-grained understanding. So these are all questions uh, for an unseen image that we can ask the algorithm and it actually gets it right. All the way down to what is the color, what color is the ball, and it identifies where the ball is and actually gets the color right. And when you extrapolate that, there are a lot of applications of that not just in security, but also in transportation. Uh, you can identify how many people are in a store, how many cars are in a parking lot at a given time with a camera and so on. So a lot of really great applications for computer vision. 
In fact, there are some that I think will change us also as a human species almost a little bit. Uh, in many ways, we've gotten where we are by being much more efficient in how we create food, moving from a hunter and gatherer society to an agricultural society, and then the industrial revolution. And now with AI, you can actually automate even more of the agricultural stuff. There's a company called Blue River that uh, picks lettuce leaves automatically and waters each plant depending on how much water that plant needs. And you can automate all of that uh, in agriculture with the help of computer vision. Now, I only have one slide on robotics. Uh, robotics is another of the three main areas of AI. We have natural language processing, robotics, and computer vision. Um, robotics, we still struggle a lot. Uh, there's, in many ways, we're, we're still not even at the level of a honeybee uh, when it comes to motor control, motor cortex. And it's also something that we don't often associate with intelligence, though we do ascribe a lot of value to being able to shoot a very small ball into a very small hole very far away. Um, can make a lot of money if you're good at that. Um, uh, in many ways, uh, there's also mechanical issues still, uh, and so I think actual robotics that will work, walk around like normal people do in a work environment is still very far away, both on the mechanical side and the algorithmic side. And the problem there is that it's hard to find just a static data set like we have in computer vision. In computer vision, we can say, here are a thousand images of cats. You go and classify that. In robotics, there's no like, Here's your actuator and your arm with all these different degrees of freedom that you can move around, and some of which are invariant to how you actually want to uh, manipulate an object. And you actually have to have a whole environment that trains the algorithm over and over again. It's a very different uh, regime. It's called reinforcement learning instead of the standard supervised learning where you can just have a training and a test set. Now, where I think it gets the most exciting uh, in what I think is the most interesting manifestation of human intelligence is actually natural language processing. It's also how we communicate. It's connected to thought. There are a lot of really interesting philosophical problems about it, but it's also directly relevant to business. And it's been used for a very long time in search. It's a multi-billion dollar industry to understand language very well. However, it's also really hard. Uh, so this is a fun story from 2011, uh, where people, several people noticed that whenever Anne Hathaway started a movie, reviews came out, reviews were positive, the stocks for the company Berkshire Hathaway went up <laughs> significantly, um, more so than chance, uh, several times. And so it's clear that there are algorithmic trading companies that just basically struggled with what we call entity resolution or entity disambiguation. Uh, and in general, ambiguity is a big problem in natural language understanding. There are a lot of different ways you can phrase the same idea, uh, have the same meaning, but to describe it in many different ways. And so when we look at applications and when you think about where you could use AI in your company, you have to essentially, in most cases, think of a very straightforward mapping from some input X to some output Y. And if you can create a data set that has ideally hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of examples of an input X with an output Y, then you can likely automate that quite well. So a simple and fun example of uh, that in natural language processing is sentiment analysis. So here are a couple of the hard examples that really, really good sentiment analysis algorithms now can also accurately classify. So the first one here is, in its ragged, cheap, and unassuming way, the movie works or the best way to hope for any chance of enjoying this film is by lowering your expectations. Standard machine learning algorithms up until maybe two or three years ago would have always said, oh, this is clearly you know, a positive sentence here in the second case because it's got best and chance and enjoying and it doesn't really have a very negative word in it and so they looked at all these words in isolation and basically incorrectly would have said this is positive now we can have sentiment analysis algorithms that would correctly classify that sentence. And that is just one of many examples of text classification. Uh, text classification we can do very accurately. It sounds kind of you know, boring, like text classification, but there are endless amounts of applications of that in the business world as well as in the consumer space. Uh, so in sales, for instance, you can classify specific leads. Uh, in services, you can route emails to different people can classify them, whether it's a billing question that's coming in and route it to that group. Eventually, you can even classify which knowledge base article should answer that incoming service request and then eventually automate that whole process. 
um, to some degree for some questions that you see very frequently. Again, as long as you have an X and a Y. Lots of inputs associated with the outputs that you're already keeping track of, maybe in a CRM, maybe post-talk uh, by labeling your data, then you can automate that kind of process. Here's a, an example of an input-output mapping that I'm very excited about. Uh, it's actually a very recent research breakthrough that we've made uh, inside our research group uh, on text summarization. So I've worked during my PhD at Stanford and tried a lot of times to make an algorithm generate a long, coherent sequence of words, like multiple sentences, and it never worked. And when I saw these results, I was, I was personally blown away. I was very excited uh, when, when my team was finally able to create summaries like this. So the input here is a longer document, and the output is a couple of sentence summary. And what it does is it basically copies over sometimes words or phrases from different parts of the original longer document, but it can also generate completely new words that aren't in the original document but are basically more concise. And here's a fun uh, sort of meta summary about uh, a blog post that we wrote about our summarization algorithm, and it, I, was, I couldn't have been happier about that summary. Um, it's, it's, it's quite accurate. Now, of course, if you want to use summarization technology for a complex sales process, let's say sales process gets escalated uh, to somebody else and they want to get the quick summary of where this process has been in the last couple of weeks or months, then you would have to actually give the algorithm sales emails and their summaries. Uh, so this was trained on news corpora, and sometimes the transfer, the main transfer, is still an issue. So this is hot off the press. It's not going to come out in the next month or so as, as a product, um, sort of forward-leaning at the very edge of natural language processing. Now, another one I want to show you in a live demo. Uh, it's called the Dynamic Co-Attention Network. It's another uh, paper that we've published and that we're working with. And it's a question answering system. So question answering, I think, is one of the most interesting problems in NLP. Because in some ways, it's a meta problem. Um, my company is called MetaMind. I love meta platforms. That's why it's so great to be at Salesforce, because we're building, in some ways, a meta platform that allows hundreds of thousands of companies to create their own apps, to create their own AI solutions, and uh, their own workflows and everything. And so here, um, this particular question answering aspect basically assumes that the answer to a specific question is in the document. And instead of just saying, you know, it's one of these documents and you go look for the answer, it actually tries to extract the span and actually give the right answer. And so we can look at this question here. When did he begin his presidential campaign? This is about Obama. And oh, my network died. Just now restarted. All right. Bad timing. Um, well, turns out it will get it correct. Um, I tried it before. <laughs> See if we can go back. All right. Um, I've tried these so many times I can basically tell you uh, what the actual, uh, what the questions are and the answers, what the answers will be. So the next question I was going to ask is, uh, when did Obama hit the national stage? And so there's no ex exact sentence that says Obama hit the national stage of this year, but there is a sentence that said we received national attention during his campaign. And so it learned to essentially uh, abstract away from these, this particular way of phrasing that sentence and understood enough of the question to really accurately answer that question. And my Wi-Fi came back, so let's see if we can look at the next example. Yeah, great. So here is a more complex article uh, about Salesforce, because uh, the original data set was only trained on Wikipedia and kind of simple stuff. And we're like, well, let's see what happens if we put in recent news article from around the time we're working on this paper earlier this year. And here, again, it can only answer questions based on this document. So the answer to what is Salesforce's CRM, we're, we're happy with that um, for this, you know, just uh, getting the, extracting the answers. Um, we can also ask, what does USDA stand for? And, you know, there's no, USDA is the abbreviation for this, but it basically picked up uh, that that's the phrase here and the abbreviation for it. And what's even more exciting is we can ask more complex questions like, what is the advantage for FSA to switch to a cloud-based platform? And 
what does it extract? It extracts can realize time and cost efficiencies. So basically, this is a great uh, step for in the direction of allowing people to ask questions in a lot of different kinds of ways and yet get the same correct answer. So if you want to deflect service cases, for instance, and not have people actually send out an email, uh, even if they can find the exact phrasing and FAQ listing, because they try to rephrase their question differently, this kind of system would give you the help. Or if you have service staff or anybody really in your company, there's a lot of different you know, documents out there to try to find answers, you can eventually incorporate this and get the answers that you need right away. All right, so with that, um, I think hopefully you got a little bit of a better sense of where we are in AI. So there's still a lot of work uh, that needs to get done, but we have made a lot of progress in speech, in computer vision, uh, now in natural language processing, uh, and in several other fields. I think AI is not something we should look at in isolation. I think we can think of it almost like electricity in the sense that it will change every single industry in the next couple of years and decades. And it's, you know, yes, there are electricity companies, but it's more exciting to think about all the things you actually do with electricity. And like, likewise for AI, it's always AI plus X. And when you want to make AI uh, work very well, um, you have to think of a couple of different ingredients. And those three, other than the people that help you make those ingredients, those three are the data, the algorithms, and the workflow integration. And so what do I mean by this? First, it's important that you collect the data. It's all stored in one place. And ideally, the metadata is associated with it and the outcomes that you care about are already being recorded. So for instance, in summarization, you might not have any summaries anywhere. So you actually have to go out and manually create those summaries. But if in the service case, you already keep track of you know, emails coming in in one place, this was the final answer, this was the knowledge base article that answers that email, then you can easily take that data and train the AI algorithm right away. And those are the kinds of things where we understand the workflows at Salesforce, and we actually want to automate that to a degree where you just literally click a button and it starts answering emails. Uh, this is in the future, not happening right now, um, but something we're working on. So the data is the number one thing. It's often also the main stumbling block, the main roadblock uh, in the beginning for a lot of AI projects. Then we have the algorithms. Uh, those can be quite general and be applied to lots of different kinds of data sets. And then what's very important in the end is also to really understand the workflows of how you ingest uh, and infuse specific uh, products, features, and, and workflows with AI. It's very important that you feel people make people feel empowered and not feel like they're training their replacements and things like that. So that was one of the reasons I was excited uh, last year to join Salesforce because we really have a very good place for having the data. It's in the cloud. We have great algorithms now through our research team and other data science groups. And we really understand specific workflows. We're not going to tell a robotics company how to do robotics or a truck company how to build self-driving cars. But when it comes to sales, service, marketing, community cloud, and commerce, uh, we can really understand these workflows and help our customers uh, bring AI uh, to fruition. A bunch of cool uh, new things that are coming out on this, on this front. Um, I won't go into too many details. I think one that is very exciting is on, on the sales cloud. Uh, front where we have opportunity lead scoring. So imagine uh, as a salesperson, there are 10,000 people you might be reaching out to on a gi any given day, but you don't know if they actually want to get your sales call and if this is the right time. Uh, opportunity lead scoring will go through all of these uh, emails that were sent between two potentially very large organizations, all the structured data, and eventually tell you today, these 10 people are the best people to actually reach out to. So it's a really powerful capability that improves uh, sales efficiency, in some cases, quite significantly. Now, jumping back out to the general sort of patterns that I think we'll, we'll see in the future is I think AI will essentially help us to get rid of more and more of the repetitive and kind of boring tasks out there and allow us to focus more on creative and unique tasks in our daily work lives. And in many ways, I think that will be very exciting and make uh, for eventually a more interesting uh, work environment in a lot of different industries. And maybe as a last word, I think it's important uh, as we're building this future in AI 
to think of not just a diverse workforce, but also diversity and bias in our data sets. If our data sets are biased, AI will pick up that bias and eventually amplify it and be even worse. So it's very important to think about how we collect the data and which potential biases uh, are in the training data and then try to avoid that AI algorithms. All right, thank you. Great, thank you. And we were speaking before the, uh, before the presentation and, and thought that obviously there'll be plenty of opportunity for questions. So Richard's done an awesome job of introducing the topic to us, giving us a sense of where the world's going and where the world's up to in terms of the latest research. So it's now over to us in terms of uh, any questions that you might have. There are roving mics, so please feel free to put up your hand and let us know. I know enough names in the room that I will call on you by name <laughs> if, uh, no pressure. if I don't get some, uh, some questions. I might start with one just to, uh, just to open the conversation. Um, so Richard, we've got around about 4 million customers at, at AMP and we have quite a lot of data about those customers, but obviously that data pretty much pertains to our dealings with them. How, how do you see people augmenting their own data with external data sets in order to better interact and, and drive more intelligent interaction with their customers? It's a great question. I think it is uh, important, uh, you know, again, it's the data algorithms workflow integrations, but sometimes you don't have to have all the data uh, in your own data centers to make use of it. So there are data management platforms, and especially in, in marketing, uh, there are things like Crux is another acquisition uh, that Salesforce has made uh, that allows uh, basically a lot of different companies to store a ton of data. It's sometimes almost freaky. Um, like they keep track of over 4 billion endpoints. What is an endpoint? It's an app, a browser, a uh, phone, and so on. They keep track of over 4 billion endpoints so that if you're in the end a company and you say, oh, I want to talk to all the 25 to 35 year olds who like surfing and live in Eastern Australia, uh, then they can say, all right, here are you know, 10 million endpoints that, or maybe, I don't know, two more realistic number for that segment, uh, that will actually likely be you know, uh, in that group. And then you can advertise to them. And so it allows companies, for instance, to advertise to very specific segments without actually having to have access to the original data. And they don't have access, they don't know who those people exactly are, but they have these sort of uh, anonymous kinds of groups. Mm, very interesting. Questions from the audience? Someone, I'm assuming someone's monitoring our, our Twitter feed, but uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll keep going. So AMP, uh, is, is, is an, an old company in the South, I think we're at 160 odd years old. What would, what would your advice be for us in terms of how we might get started on, on the journey of better leveraging artificial intelligence with the, with the rich history that we've got? It's a tough, it's a tough process uh, in many ways. I think the number one step is having your data in the right place and thinking about which processes are ripe for automation. Uh, which processes can you, if you were able to do it much faster, cheaper, slightly more accurate, um, you would benefit the most from and your customers would benefit the most from. I think sometimes, for instance, uh, people start with, oh, we want to save money in service. Uh, and then they actually realize once they free up uh, service organizations by deflecting more cases through AI, uh, they realize now their service folks actually have more time and they can do cross and upselling. They can use recommendation engines uh, to understand, you know, these people who've bought these kinds of products are more likely to also be interested in those other kinds of products. And that can help a lot um, in the end uh, in the actual sales. So sometimes the AI has almost unintended consequences. And I think in the next couple of years, you really have to get started on that journey uh, with AI because as you have more data and if you make use of it, there's a very positive uh, virtuous cycle. But if you don't use it and your competitors mm -hmm. make more and more advantage of it, I think that's a downward spiral. And, and who do you see doing that particularly well? It, it Maybe globally, it's, it's probably a question in terms of who do, who do you see as the leaders in terms of going on that virtuous, virtuous journey? Right now, what I've observed is really that it is uh, largely in the consumer space. So Google, Facebook, 
Amazon, uh, those are sort of very big powerhouses. And especially Google and Facebook, you know, have these essentially money printing machines uh, from advertisement. They spend many billions of dollars in their R&D. And fortunately, the research community of open source and publications, academic publications, is very open. So uh, others can understand at least what's going on, but of course don't have the data assets always. Uh, and what's exciting about Einstein for us is that we have the same kinds of algorithms and we compete with Google uh, and, and others and, and are doing quite well in sort of academic benchmarks. Uh, and we have enterprise sort of workflow understanding and, uh, and data. So our plan is to get that same kind of capability and level of sophistication AI into the enterprise world. And there, there are many fewer, uh, many fewer players that really are as far ahead uh, when it comes to bringing AI um, to fruition. Great. I'll take the liberty of asking another question. You mentioned recommendation engines that I'm, I think that's a very interesting structure. When Salesforce works with an organization, what's the level of readiness in terms of structured versus unstructured data? Mm -hmm. Recommendation engines automatically get you into a certain amount of scale they set the stage for either AI or machine learning. There's a graph. Tell me how long does that sort of thing take when you work with an organization that says, we've got a lot of data, recommendation engines seem like a logical way to get more value from it. Is this a regular methodology or is it improvised? Is it bespoke? What, what's been your experience, particularly given that you come from an NLP background on, on this? Great question. Um, so we often think about AI f first as packaged apps. You click a button and it'll just work. That's what happens uh, in opportunity lead scoring. Uh, that's what happens in the recommendation engines on the commerce cloud uh, side. If you have a commerce cloud, people use it. You can you are automatically keep track of which users click on what and then you show recommendations based on that with the recommendation engine. Uh, then we often observe, uh, especially in enterprise, I lovingly call each, each enterprise customer a special little snowflake, um, where they, there's, every company has their own business processes, uh, initially their own custom fields, eventually completely custom objects that are very unique to that organization, and then sometimes there's a core that uh, I guess, uh, is more common. And so people want to then start to create their own, uh, modify the AI solutions. Uh, and then the third step is often to build a completely custom app. And you know, similarly to having started with Sales Cloud, then having custom fields and objects uh, in the database, and eventually having Force.com, which is basically a platform that allows you to essentially rebuild all our own tools uh, from scratch if you really wanted to. It doesn't make sense to do, but um, you can build completely own your, your own tools, your own apps that are you know, with your company logo on it and so on, people can use and they're completely incorporated in custom workflows and everything. So I think it's a similar idea for AI, where we start with custom apps, we let you modify them, and eventually we let you train your and completely own classifier. So a good example in marketing, marketing world is first we just say, we have pre-trained classifiers that identify the scene in which you might see your customers. Somebody hashtags your product, and we can classify, you know, let's say it's like a sports shoe manufacturer or something like that, and we can classify are they showing them on beach scenes or in forest scenes or in mountains or in cities to understand their customer customers a little bit better. But now we also allow you to create your completely own image classifiers. Uh, and so we found, you know, people want to sell solar panels and they want to classify roof structures based on Google Street View images. Uh, we can find service cases where people want to take a picture of specific replacement parts and then automatically get assigned what they are. So let me ask an unfair question, but again, it's a large company. How sophisticated are the data governance practices of companies so that, in fact, you can match the classifiers against the data sets in a way that doesn't take months to do or weeks to do? Uh, it's, it's a tough problem for a lot of companies, uh, and we really see a broad range of data readiness uh, across, across the industry. Uh, and I have some cases where people come in super excited, I want to build this great AI feature. I'm like, that's totally doable, let's do it. Where's your data set? <clears throat> and then uh, they say, oh, I don't have the data set. And then I say, all right, I'll see you in two to 24 months. Um, so sometimes it's tough. Uh, the further you are 
ahead in you know having at least thinking like a CRM is actually a really good place and I mean obviously I have sort of my, my Salesforce hat on but uh, uh, when I say that but it's it's true in that it's a central location for your customer data uh, and if you have a central repository that shows you that you have that mindset of trying to keep things in one place and actually having metadata associated with it having it tagged and that actually is often a step a good first step uh, to using AI Right. Any other? Catherine. So one of the other themes we've heard a lot about here is about empathy and about um, being very human and how we use data in that way. Mm -hmm. um, a CRM system is at the, the interconnect between those. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you're bringing that um, to the way you're using AI? So I think there are lots of different levels uh, of how to bring empathy into AI and so empathy and, and sort of the, the ethics that you would hope fall out of having a lot of empathy uh, is something that's very top of mind for us, uh, especially as we open up these capabilities to allow people to create their completely own classifiers. Um, so different levels. One is the, the empathy on us as creating that platform, understanding our customers and helping them understand their customers better. Um, another level, another angle is, is just the standard sort of, or not standard, but the, the ethics angle of a lot, not everything you can build with AI you maybe should build. So uh, we're working uh, on some very general purpose capabilities that let you train your completely own classifiers. And when you do that, you could in theory create almost illegal classifiers. You can build a credit scoring and you add as a feature race and gender and all these other things and that's illegal in, in the United States and, and many other places fortunately. And so with this great power comes a great responsibility. So you really have to educate people around um, ethics standards and, and thinking carefully about the biases that might be in historic data uh, and sort of have empathy with, with your customers uh, and you know, millennials and all of that. So there's no silver bullet. I think in the end it comes down a lot to education and, uh, and training people on a continuing basis. Uh, that is something that we do a lot uh, both on the management side as well as on the data science side uh, with a tool that we call Trailhead. Uh, so we use it internally first to, to train a lot of people and have sort of very fun gamified uh, badges and you know, can see sort of top leaders and, and badges and you have modules that we call trails and uh, it kind of becomes fun and competitive uh, in, in some groups and I think that is a good place to also infuse sort of your 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 values you've got oh please <laughs> Right. If you think of yourself and your, your pension and your personal finances and wealth management, how do you envisage it will be when you're, say, 50 or 60 when those, you know, what do you see the future given what you know now and what you see? In wealth management in particular? Yeah, and, and, and your own personal financial goals and how you think about how you'll be looking at your finances in the future. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a general principle. Yeah. Leave, leave the numbers out. Yeah. <laughs> you can. But how you see yourself interacting about your with your with your finances and your wealth? Um, I think. Yeah, I have to <laughs> <laughs> Just track my numbers there. Um, I think the general uh, pattern that I see that is is true for wealth management, but it's probably true for most other industries as well, is that the current generation will res uh, es um, expect more and more of a personalization, more and more personalization than, than we've had before. Like if I send a picture on Twitter about something, then ideally that can be taken into consideration when I have a service case or something. So I might take a picture of my shoes and say, ah, oh, these crappy things just fell apart. And I don't say hashtag this is the product name and ID and the company and you know please help me. But ideally, they'll still find that tweet and they could still reach out. Now sometimes it's a little uncanny when when you know they reach out on Facebook or something. It depends on like the the avenue where you see the data. But you would expect if it's on Twitter, for instance, that they could reach out and say, hey, if you want, we can help you out, send you a replacement. Likewise, if I have uh, like some big life event and you know I don't know, let's say there's something horrific happened and I shared on, on Facebook, 
Um, and uh, I don't think first about my wealth management, but my wealth manager might see it. Maybe we're even friends on Facebook or he follows me or something. Uh, then they could already set up a certain kinds of, you know, I don't know, wills and estate planning or something like that. So, uh, yeah, there are, I think personalization is, is the number one thing where I want to have a portfolio that's very guided to my own, uh, you know, background and all, all my plans and and my plan's changing also. And sometimes maybe proactively saying, hey, we've noticed you're doing a lot of that. Maybe that your portfolio should change and reflect that change in your life. Um, mm -hmm. So this, sometimes it's a little uncanny and you have to be careful to straddle that line of like, do they want to share that data? Do you, do you want them to know that you know uh, all these things? Uh, but if they do, then definitely uh, using it to personalize the experience would be great. We've probably got time for about one more question. I've got one quick one, I think. You've touched on a couple of things in terms of being uncanny and some of the ethical concerns. What, beyond that, what do you worry about with respect to the emergence of this uh, technology more broadly? What, 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 what keeps you awake in terms of the, the, you know, the potential risks associated with deploying technologies like this? Let me start by saying I'm not worried about Skynet. Um, we don't have <laughs> anything uh, remotely close to, you know, Terminator, self-aware, silly stuff. Like, it's fun science fiction. I love, you know, the science fiction and action movies too, but it's just sometimes the, the field gets a little overhyped and then people are, on the one hand, overly excited in a positive way, but then also some people uh, get overly worried. Um, I think, in general, we do have to think about continuous education. Um, in some ways, uh, AI and data is almost like a capital. Uh, and in some ways, it's, it could potentially become a rich get richer scheme, and people are falling yeah. behind uh, who don't have uh, those kinds of assets. Um, and so I think education is a really important step as we're making that progression uh, as, as a society. Um, then I think certain areas of applications I'm worried about too. I don't have to work uh, on them, but this technology in AI is very general purpose. It's like the internet or cars, right? Internet and cars sound like great things, but cars kill thousands of people every year. Um, internet can be used to share terrible things online. Uh, and likewise, AI could be used, um, mm. you know, my, the image classifiers I talked about, you could in theory create a shoot, not shoot classifier. Mm. It's terrible and I hope nobody would do it, but it's general purpose technology. We bring, we give the algorithms out. Uh, it's all public knowledge, they're open source solutions. Everybody could do, do these kinds of things. So uh, those kinds of things worry me a little bit. Um, and just generally having people have exactly empathy uh, and considering sort of the implications of the people that are touched by these algorithms. Uh, and that's something that, we think about a lot at Salesforce. We recently joined this partnership on AI to benefit uh, society, and it's a great, uh, great collaboration between Amazon, Google, Facebook, lots of big companies. Um, and it's it's something that we have to consider and think about very carefully in the future. Very good. All right, we might uh, we might wrap it up there. Can everyone please join me in thanking? Uh, thank you. Thank you.